Welcome to Stories with a Twang. I'm Nathan. Today's episode is called I Found a Red VHS Tape in My Grandma's Collection. What I Saw Still Terrifies Me, Part 2, by C.F. Ortiz. This is part two of a story I read a few weeks ago called He Wore a Wooden Mask. So if you haven't listened to part one, go back and do so now and I'll be here waiting for you when you get back. Sorry for not posting my update sooner. The last few days have been... Busy, to say the least. I guess I'll start with some extra information which I originally didn't think was relevant. My grandparents' house and the house that I live in now are both in the state of Alaska. I won't say the exact year the original red tape incident happened, but I will tell you it was during the 2000s. My grandparents live in the same house. Both are healthy enough, except for the years of chronic back problems that recently put my grandpa in a wheelchair for most of the day. Thomas and Isabel, who I now realize I shouldn't have named in my first post, moved to Washington State back in high school. Come to think of it, that would have been 10 years ago. Crazy how time flies. Anyway, keep these things in mind while I tell the rest of my story. Right after I posted, I took a picture of the tape and sent it to the group chat I created with myself, Thomas, and Isabel. Underneath the picture, I texted, Hey guys. I know, I know, kinda downplayed it right, but sue me, okay? I wasn't thinking clearly. Then I waited for the police to show up to my house. I kept my grandpa's old hunting rifle, a different one from the one my grandma had in the last post, by my side the whole time. Eventually, I gave in to my morbid curiosity. I put the tape into the old VHS player I kept from my grandparents' house. As the machine slowly came to life, I dug my fingernails into my palms. Nothing. Just a black screen, but this time with no text around the sides. I grabbed the remote and rewound and fast-forwarded. Nothing ever came up. As I stared, mesmerized, at the empty screen, a sudden noise made me jump. The sound of a notification from the group chat. It was from Isabel, who was probably rightly so freaking out. She asked a hundred questions and I tried to answer as many as I could. Did you call the police? Yes. Did you watch the tape? Yes. What was on it? Nothing. Nothing? Nothing at all, I told her. I ejected the tape to get a better look at it. I focused on the writing. As a child, it was an enigma. As an adult, it was Cyrillic. I got back on my laptop, opened up a Word document, and used the Insert Characters tool to painstakingly draw out all the characters. Once they were all correct, I copied and pasted the characters into Google Translate. After about five minutes of sleuthing, I uncovered it. The strange, eerie writing that had haunted me for so long. It simply said, The Red Tape. Very useful, I thought, more than a little exasperated. Then came the knocking at my door. I was frozen until I heard the voice call. Hello? Are you inside? It's the state troopers. Badge number? I stammered. What's your badge number? He rattled off a number along with the name Jay Serrano. I was about to open the door when I realized, I have a gun. I'm holding it, just for protection. It's Alaska. Just don't point it at me and we're fine. I opened my front door to a young male cop with short brown hair. He looked through the house, checking every possible hiding spot I could think of. He found nothing and was clearly annoyed by the task. Look, there's no one around, okay? You sure it's just not a family member messing with you? My expression must have been enough of an answer for him. Okay then, I take it you want to go to the station and report it then, huh? Yes, I would like to. I'll go wait in my SUV then. If you're adamant about keeping your firearm on you, which it looks like you are, then just take that truck you have out there. We walked down my steps toward the squad car. I slung the rifle over my shoulder and went back into the house to grab a few things. My laptop, which I put in its case, the VHS tape which rattled from old age, and the VHS player. Just before I left the house, I had an epiphany. I rummaged through my junk drawer until I found a roll of scotch tape. I locked the door, and I left. Only one other cop was at the station. According to them, they were two of the three in the whole backwater town I lived in. The older, heavier cop was about as useful as his colleague. I had to insist they swab the VHS tape for fingerprints. They found none. 
I had to insist they play through the tape. It was still black. As I pulled the rattling plastic case from the player I had brought along, I lamented my utter inability to do anything, to even get a single sympathetic response. Look, I appreciate that it's a little spooky, said Officer L. Hinton, but this is the middle of nowhere Alaska. I'm sure you'll be fine. My eyes shot daggers at the old cop who hadn't once left his seat except to refill his coffee. Especially given your rather Second Amendment-like tendencies, he added while gesturing towards my rifle in the corner, the one I'd insisted on keeping near me. Despite their apathy, I managed to have them record my name and number before I left the little rinky-dink police station behind. The whole drive through the Evergreen Highway back to my home, all I could think about is why that man in the wooden mask would leave behind the VHS tape with nothing on it. Was it just to screw with me? Why would he wait nearly 20 years to do so? These thoughts kept swarming my head as my ranger's tires crunched over the gravel that was my driveway. I took another look at the tape sitting on my passenger seat. My eyes rested on it for several seconds, at the handwritten Cyrillic and the faded deep red plastic. Then I grabbed my rifle from the gun rack and pointed the scope at my door. Everything was normal save for one discrepancy. The small piece of scotch tape I'd left in the top corner, a small transparent seal bridging the door in the frame, was loose. Back into reverse, back down the evergreen highway, and into the nearest motel I could find. There I unpacked my VHS player and my laptop. As I made sure to double lock the door and double check the parking lot for anything strange, I finally relaxed. I pulled up my cell phone to see the group chat I had ghosted was full of messages from both Thomas and Isabel. I reassured them that I was okay, but also told them that the police were going to be no use. Thomas asked me what Grandma and Grandpa thought of it. I had to admit I hadn't called them. Don't you think you should? Isabel messaged as I finished plugging the cords from my player into the motel television. Luckily, the motel hadn't updated their equipment since the Clinton administration. Yeah, maybe they know something about the last time that they never told us, Thomas added. I'll call them in a bit, I assured. I want to figure out this tape first so they don't freak out over something we have no answers to. Then I reached for the tape, and for the final time that day I heard it rattle. A rattle. I shook the tape. So many VHS tapes had developed rattling noises when they got old, maybe from broken plastic or even dead bugs inside. But this rattling was different. It was heavier. Guys, I think there's something inside the tape. What's inside the tape? I don't know. Should I open it? The answer was a resounding yes. The only issue was that the VHS tape had small screws in each of the corners that I had to get out before opening the shell. And since they were too small to unscrew with the blade of my pocket knife, I needed to go get my Swiss Army from the ranger's glove box. Slowly, I crept out of the motel room. I scanned every window of the building as I made my way to the Red Ranger in the lot. Luckily, nothing seemed to be off. I managed to get back into the room with no issue. Did you open the VHS yet? No, I just got back into the room, opening it now. It's... it's a USB drive. Hesitantly, I plugged the drive into my laptop. I crossed my fingers and hoped that maybe this was an elaborate scheme to put a virus on my computer. I opened the file manager and saw the USB tab simply titled that same Cyrillic phrase, the red tape. There was nothing but a video file, a video file in English which said two, and then my grandfather's name. I didn't want to open the video. I wanted to close the laptop and throw it out and move away. But seeing my grandfather's name and not knowing what his connection was to the man in the wooden mask, I needed to know. My media player popped up. The video was that same familiar black screen with the Cyrillic text borders. Then it was the same road. The same highway, small rocks and tufts of dry pine, a simple rustic highway that nevertheless filled me with dread. Making a documentary or something? Asked the soon-to-be-dead trucker. I witnessed his lifeless purple face again, and then for the first time in almost 20 years I saw that wooden mask. The frayed gray yarn, the carved wrinkled bags, the image that had haunted me ever since my childhood. But this time, I looked deeper into the uncaring, wicked, soulless eyes of the man behind it. If I get back and that room isn't clean, said my grandmother, I watched with each passing scene slowly bringing the memories to life, the reality weighing heavy on my heart. Soon the screen returned to black nothingness of the closet, but this time there was another scene. It began in the family room with the tapes all strewn about. 
A deep, sinister <laughs> chuckling sounded from behind the camera, then a phrase in Russian that I couldn't understand. Just then I realized that I could understand. I paused the video trying not to worry too much about the timeline which showed how much footage was left to show. I got out my phone and opened up Google Translate. I played the scene again allowing my phone to listen. You see how easy they scare, old man? How easy this will be. I wished I hadn't translated it. The video continued to play. The man in the wooden mask searched through the rooms, the dining room, the laundry room, my bedroom. But before he could get to the second floor, the sound of the front door opening scared him away. He ducked into a corner as my grandmother went to the family room to see the tapes all around. Where are you kids? I heard her yell as the cameraman snuck out. But instead of darting to the woods, instead of leaving the property, he went immediately into the garage. A clutter-filled garage tucked away under the deck. One that we rarely ever entered because of the darkness and the crowdedness. A garage which offered so many places to hide. The scene went black again. It was spliced with modern footage, a couch in the center of a cabin. Then the cameraman walked from behind the tripod and took a seat on the couch. He stared into the lens, his face still covered with the rustic wooden mask. He spoke in Russian at first before I could get my phone back out to translate, he switched to English. Now this is for the grandchild, he said. Your granddaddy wants to ignore me. He wants to forget what he left behind, but I don't forget, and I won't be ignored. If your cowardly old man refuses to see me, then I'll have to come visit you, and I won't be so nice this time. The video ended. I sat there, stunned. A million questions flew through my head. I didn't have any answers, but I knew where to start. I pulled up my contacts and went to call the people I should have called to begin with. But just before I could place the call, I heard a loud, hard knocking at my hotel door. I set my phone down. I stood still as a statue until the knocking sounded again, this time heavier, this time angrier. With a weary heart and a shaky hand, I looked through the peephole and saw those same soulless eyes. Looking in. All right, everyone, that's it for this week's story. I hope you all really enjoyed it. I'll be back with part three next week. I would like to give a giant thank you to C.F. Ortiz for letting me read this incredible series on the show. I hope you are all really enjoying it as much as I am. If you have any stories you would like me to read on the show, you can send them over to storieswithatwang at gmail.com. The show is on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Stories with a Twang Podcast. It would mean an awful lot if you could rate and review the show wherever you listen, and don't forget to share with your friends and family as well. I hope you all have a wonderful week, and until next time, remember that a little twang goes a long way.